January 12, 1945. One of the fiercest offensives of World War II has just begun on the Eastern Front. In it, more than two million soldiers of the Red Army are launched on a German army that is totally crushed and that little or nothing can do to contain the Soviet onslaught. This operation was known as the Vistula Oder Offensive, which ended with Stalin's troops less than 70 kilometers from Berlin by the end of January 1945. This was the first time that Red Army soldiers set foot inside of the original border of the Third Reich and with this, panic seized the German population. It is estimated that between 8 and 10 million German civilians began a desperate flight towards Berlin, in order to escape from the Soviet soldiers. This escape was totally disorganized and with temperatures reaching 20 degrees below zero. Many of them died from cold, hunger, exhaustion, or bombing. Most of those left behind also did so at the hands of Soviet troops who, the moment they set foot in East Prussia, erupted in unstoppable bloodlust and revenge. Without going into all the crimes and barbarities that occurred here, which we will see soon in a live program, we are going to analyze the reaction of the soldiers of the Red Army, upon coming face to face with German society and its way of life. This that we are going to see next, without a doubt, is one of the greatest paradoxes of those times, which has gone quite unnoticed. According to the Soviet correspondent Vasily Grossman himself, it all started when the frontline troops were arriving on German soil. Suddenly, they began to realize that urbanism was quite different. They had been told for years that the Soviet Union represented a paradise for the peasantry and the worker. Once they began to see the houses in the area, which were large, well-kept and mostly had nice gardens, the Soviets believed that they were the houses of wealthy German barons. They quickly began to destroy and burn them, also destroying everything they found inside. Little by little they realized that there could not be so many barons in Germany, since the vast majority of houses they came across had these characteristics. However, this did not prevent the destruction from stopping. Everything went up in flames in East Prussia, to such an extent that when night came, the soldiers hardly had anywhere to go for shelter from the cold. Later it was learned that in addition to the hatred they felt for the Germans, this destruction was also motivated so that the Soviet rearguard troops, as well as their high-ranking officers, could not garnish or seize anything when they reached their positions. They called them the General Staff Bugs and the Rear Guard Bugs. Although in their countries, most of the houses were made of wood, here all the houses were of brick and stone, with a garden full of well-trimmed hedges and with excellent roads throughout the area. The Soviets were also surprised by the large number of pianos they found in practically every house and by the presence of radio sets in abundance. All these elements were provoking more and more, a mixture of envy, bewilderment, anger and admiration towards the Germans, which could hardly be controlled. They also felt deceived by their own leaders, realizing that many issues that they had been told were lies, however, due to the feeling of revenge they felt towards the Germans, this was quickly redirected towards them. The question that many soldiers of the Red Army asked themselves, as they left it in writing, was, for what reason did these Germans who live so well invade us, if in our country compared to theirs, there is only misery? A Soviet soldier noted, how are we going to treat these Germans? They lack nothing, they are well fed, they have good houses and cattle. They have orchards with apple trees, and they come and invade us. They even reached my city, more than 1,000 kilometers from here. For that alone, Captain, we should throttle them all. As expected, the ideological department of the Soviet army soon paid attention to the different reports from the postal censors, which warned that the soldiers were writing many letters to their families, in which they were told about this contrast in the standard of living. Although these soldiers did not do it with bad intentions, it was clear that this information when arriving home, could have an incorrect political interpretation. This caused the postal censorship departments to work overtime to hide all this information that the soldiers were writing on their letters. As an anecdote, here we have to include that due to the lack of paper that the soldiers had, they resorted to papers and postcards that they took from German houses, carrying many of these sheets, anti-communist slogans that the Germans had. This caused the Soviet high command to make an effort to send paper to the soldiers to write, and that situations of this type would not occur again. 
A striking event was that some soldiers who had never seen light bulbs, because electricity did not reach their villages, were amazed at this invention and stole them with the idea that they would also light up their houses. They clearly thought that they were not connected to anything, and that the light came from inside the bulb itself. In addition, as Cornelius Ryan tells in his book, griffins and other items were also taken for the same purpose. Another fundamental aspect of this episode was the reaction on the part of the Soviet authorities, with the prisoners of their state that were being released. These numbered in the millions and had been falling under German control during their advance in 1941 and 1942. This group of Soviets who found themselves in German territory was very heterogeneous. There were forced laborers, prisoners of war, and lastly, Soviets fighting on the German side. In addition to this group that was fighting with the Germans, most of whom were shot on the spot, the other two were not spared numerous punishments either. There are testimonies from many of them who described that the German treatment had been very harsh, but the treatment now given to them by their own compatriots was even worse. They were accused of being traitors, deserters, collaborators, and along etc. Some men who could fight were incorporated into the Red Army to launch them in the last offensive towards Berlin, but despite this, after the battle, they were arrested and interrogated again, many of them being sent to concentration camps, along with the who had already been sent after being accused of being traitors. The Soviet women who were held captive were also subjected to a treatment quite similar to that of the Germans themselves, with all that this implies. On the other hand, the situation for the Germans at this time was the most critical they had experienced in the entire war. For the first time, waves of millions of people were desperately heading inside its borders. With them they brought a few material belongings and their heartbreaking testimonies. Although many German defeats had been hidden from their population, as is customary for all countries when things are not going well, this catastrophe could not be contained. Although the news reported that the fighting was taking place around Warsaw, the reality was that the front line had been completely overwhelmed in the first days of the offensive. The Soviet armored columns were advancing tens of kilometers a day towards Berlin, without anything being able to stop them. Once these refugees began to arrive, and with them the stories of the great atrocities that the Soviets were committing on children, youth, adults, and the elderly, as well as all their property, this catastrophe had to be made public. There was no other choice but to spread these stories officially, and make the population understand the fate that awaited them if they were not able to overcome the situation. Either he fought, at the risk of death, or he would die for sure once the Soviets captured him if he surrendered. In a similar way to what Stalin did in the summer of 1942 with his famous Order No. 227, entitled with the phrase, not a step back, Himmler who had been appointed commander of the Vistula Army Group, had to give an order identical to the German troops. This order was called, death and punishment to those who do not do their duty. Finally, after suffering huge military and civilian losses, the Germans were able to consolidate a more or less stable front along the Oder River by mid-February, awaiting the final Soviet onslaught. Well, so far this program, in which we have seen what this first culture shock meant to the Soviet soldiers who arrived in Germany. If you want to see the complete military development of this offensive, I will leave you this program in the description, in which we analyzed it a few months ago. We say goodbye here. Many thanks to everyone, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one. See you soon.